Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethel. It is good to see you here this morning. Please stand as we get started with our service with Friend of God. There we go. <laughs> Who am I that you are mindful of me? Him with glass. 
that you are here worshiping with us today. Uh, it is good to see everyone. This is kind of wrapping up vacation season and before we're getting uh, ready to go to school, so it is good to see uh, quite a few people here. Um, I know we're going to be having corporate prayer here in a minute, um, but uh, please be in uh, prayer for our schools and our kids, our teachers. I know those that work in the buildings are going a little crazy the last couple weeks. Um, and those at home are going a little crazy because the kids need to be back in the building. Um, and so, <laughs> but they're getting excited. Uh, school for Independence starts a week from Monday. So they have one more week. Blue Springs, is that the same, same. time? All right, so we've got another week. Um, but uh, preparations, schedules, uh, fall sports, all of that is starting up. So please continue to remember that. Uh, please continue to worship with us with In the Sweet By and By. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. sorrow no more, not a sigh for the blessing of rest, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Bountiful Father above, we shall offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground Thank you. 
everyone this fine day have much to pray about this morning we may have much to celebrate today you may be seated as we gather together in this time in our service where we are going to pray together as a family uh, as we recognize and 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 understand some things going on in our world as we uh, as we um, deal with much that's going on around us. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. The next words tell us much about how we should live in light of that statement. Verse 1 says again, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So, verse 2, therefore, we will not fear. We have no reason to live in fear today as we walk through life because the promises of God are with us and evident and forever. So as we pray to get today, as we think about those on our prayer list this morning that are in the hospital, those who are uh, have, have, have just been sick for a while, we recognize and know that, that God is in control. And even as the uncertainty of all that's going on with those sicknesses is just that. I would say to you, we will not fear. Do not be afraid. You see that over and over and over in Scripture. Do not be afraid. And I would ask you today to embrace that statement. Welcome that into your heart and let that be a calming influence in your life, in your day, sometimes even in your moments, <clears throat> moments of uncertainty and moments that lead to anxiety and other issues. I'm going to ask Alan and Deanna Bourne if they would come to the front this morning. I know they don't want to do this. You know they don't want to do this, but uh, we need to, to spend some time this morning um, as a family, uh, not saying anything other than so long, see you later, right? We are not uh, going to go that, to, to, we're not saying goodbye, we're saying so long, see you later, okay? And I want to talk just a minute about uh, each one of these two um, as, we, as we pray for them, with them, maybe about them, all right? But uh, just, just, um, servants here at Bethel, servants here at Bethel. And I'm reminded, uh, as I was thinking about this, uh, Al, I'm, I'm reminded about this for you. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus gives uh, in, in the, 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 uh, the title of that section of Scripture in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 26, says this, 
the greatness of serving. The greatness of serving. And he talks about those in the back. Those in the back. Those who don't want to be seen. Those who don't want to be heard. Those who just want to serve. They just want to run the sound system. They don't want to be anything else. And here's the thing about that. What that does in, in those who just want to serve is those in the back make those in the front look good. Okay? Those in the back make those in the front look good. And that has been the heart of this man since I've known him these years at Bethel. Thank you for your service. Okay? Thank you for never seeking anything other than a chance to serve. Okay? That's my thank you to you. D, Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength at the beginning, right? A very present help in trouble, right? What does the end of Psalm 46 say? You know this because this is your verse, right? The end of Psalm 46 says this, right? Be still and know that I am God. But there's more, okay? There is more because it says I will be I will be, God will be exalted among the nations. God will be exalted in the earth. As, as you live those, that verse, you exalt the name of Jesus. You've demonstrated the, the, that, that living in stillness exalts the name of Jesus. Thank you for your example of living out that scripture even as in the days leading up to this time it's not been free of anxiety it's not been free of fretting it's not been free of what am I going to do next right the scripture tells us Therefore, we will not fear as we are still and knowing that he is God. Okay, so I'm going to invite anyone who wants to just come uh, and, and not surround them. If you come up and you, and you want to, to, to come up and pray with Al and, and Dee, I would ask that you put your mask on as you come this, this direction. If you don't want to do that, just pray this morning for them. Uh, and and for, for, for our others, and then I'm going to ask you to take these cards off, off of this. this is, these are all for you, and there's probably some more coming, uh, coming later. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask Mario if he would come and just offer a prayer over Al and Dee. I'm going to pray for our, our family in general, and then Al's going to pray, or the, Mario is going to pray for Al and Dee. You pray with us. You pray with Al and Dee as they have chosen to go serve somewhere else. They've, they've, they've trained up all the rest of you guys, right? And so now they're ready to go. And God is ready for us to release them to go and serve in another place. So let's pray together as a family. God, you are good to us, and you have showered us with so many blessings that we can't even name them all. And that, God, as we come to a time in our, in our world and we come to a time in our congregation where we have some uncertainties and there are people who are, uh, who, who are and have been and have been in the hospital and, 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 and sick and with so many unanswered questions. But, God, I pray that you would just shower uh, your peace upon those affected specifically. We, we, we pray uh, for Brendan today, and we ask that your hand would touch him, would touch him in more than just a physical way, but God, that your hand would touch him in a way that draws him to you, <clears throat> and that he would know that, that you will be exalted in the earth. And so, God, we, we pray for others who uh, have uh, have. have experienced sickness and are, are, are praying for family members as well, that your hand would touch them, not just in a physical way, but deeply in a spiritual way as well. And as your word tells us to do, we will give you the praise and the glory for all that your 
you've already done. We just haven't experienced it yet because of Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, it's just awesome to be in your presence. The presence of how the saints prepare to travel to North Carolina. We ask the Lord to be with them, bless them, to help them feel us as they ready to travel. We know that we are God, that you open doors for them to serve others in the way they serve us. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to love them and to be loved by them. We ask you to protect them, to guide them as they move to North Carolina. We ask you, Lord, to just continue to bless them, continue to show your love through them. all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. I think my mic just broke. Oh, it's not you anymore. Never mind. Oh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to worship with you and to celebrate, really, with you. Because, you see, the piece that we can celebrate, the piece of this that we can celebrate, is um, that there is another congregation, there is another body of believers who get a chance to experience all that Al and Dee have to offer to them as well. And he said, I'm not going to to get involved in all of that, but he doesn't know the plans that God has laid out for him, all right, even as he tries to really stay in the background. um, I'll probably be giving a call to a pastor of a church somewhere saying, hey, you need to find this guy, and you need to track him down, and you need to put him to good use, all right? So just know that, Al, that if you get that call, um, today, if you get that call, today is for you, all right? Today is for you. Matthew chapter 5, I would invite that you to take your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, as we open God's Word, and we begin to work through 
life situations that Jesus is going to um, be very clear about and some things that we need to be um, aware of. I will tell you before I read the scripture today that, D, you're going to miss my favorite part of the Sermon on the Mount, all right? <laughs> so you're going to have to tune in. I'll, we'll, we'll let you know when the, when the do not worry message was preached, all right? We'll let you know that and when that's going to be, all right? Matthew chapter 5, we will begin in, in verse number 21. Stand with me, if you will, as we read God's word together. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. The Father, I ask that you would bless the reading of your word today as always, and God, that you would open our eyes and you would open our ears but God, as we see clearly in this passage, that you would open our hearts to your message for us today. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. The date is August the 15th. <clears throat> the Olympics are now over. I love the Olympics. I love parts of the Olympics. The parts of the Olympics that I really like, I don't get to watch on regular TV. <clears throat> but I love the Olympics. The games, the competitions are now complete. The awards and the medals, they have been handed out. And the athletes and the competitors have returned home. During the 17 or so days of the Olympics, there were many new records set, either Olympic records or world records. So what, you say? What these are, those new records, they are the new standards with which you need to beat, not meet, you need to beat in order to be considered the best. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus says this to us. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is going to lay out for us a whole set of new standards. In other words, Jesus is saying there's a new world record. If you want to be seen as the best, if you want to be recognized as the best, you got to do better than that which you have heard or that which you have seen. 
And so as we go through these life situations, really throughout the remainder of the Sermon on the Mount, as I was studying this, and I've been studying this, you know, most commentators and most people just think that these new standards uh, that Jesus is talking about apply only to the rest of chapter 5. But if you read the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount, these life situations that Jesus is going to talk about, they go throughout the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is going to give us this new set of standards all the way through and up to the end of chapter 7. And as he went through these life situations setting the bar anew, you know that he had to be hearing whispers. And you know that he had to have, there were eyes that were like, what? Expressions of, I don't think I can do that. Because they're just impossible. Or, really, Jesus, they're just impractical. Well, how did Jesus respond to those whispers or those looks? Well, we didn't read it. We'll get to it later. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, here's what he says. Therefore, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, strap it on, boys. Here we go. It's a whole new day. And the rest of this Sermon on the Mount is Jesus raising the bar, raising the standards for life. But see, there's a clear teaching in all of this as we recognize and as we see as we go through this, this clear teaching of Jesus is this, that God is much more concerned with how he views your heart than with what man sees you do. God is much more concerned with what he sees here than what man sees sees you do we walk around and we worry people worry about what is it that are we that we think people are gonna think we get ourselves all in a lather about something that may not even happen if I do this what are they gonna think we think without even giving a thought to what does God see in my heart life situation after life situation after life situation is going to be what is it that you have internally that makes what you do externally happen you see we act based on what how we think feel or wish or think yeah so uh, how we think or how we feel so it's it's God's standard of righteousness is first and foremost listen hear me clearly first and foremost internal thought internal attitude not external action as a man thinketh in his heart Jesus says that is what he does. But here's the thing. This was not new teaching. This is Jesus restating Old Testament truth. Right? Jesus said, I did not come to what? Destroy the law and the prophets. What is the law and the prophets? One of four things, the Ten Commandments, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, or the entirety of the Old Testament, 
which we know as Genesis through Malachi, right? Which is, in Jesus' day, remember, in Jesus' day, that's all they had was the law and the prophets. So Jesus, said, Jesus is just restating what the law and the prophets say. What do I mean by that? First Chronicles 28, 9 says this, As for you, my son Solomon, David says to him, Know the God of your father and serve him with a what? A loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches what? All hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. The Lord searches, oh no, all the intent of the heart. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of who? Those whose heart is loyal to him. And then the next part of that, which we never want to read... But in this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. Proverbs 16, 2. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord, what? Weighs the heart, weighs the spirits. 1 Samuel 16, 7. There's a new king that's going to be had. Saul has been rejected as king. And Nathan the prophet comes to Jesse and says, I need all of your sons to come. The Lord appeared, or Samuel, the Lord appeared to Samuel. Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. Meaning son number one, son number two, son number three, son number four, son number five, son number six, son number seven. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. But man, for man looks at what? The outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We worry so much about what people are going to see that we forget that God looks at our heart. Finally, Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, oh no. What am I doing? What is he doing? He's searching the heart, testing the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doings. This is not Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. It is not new teaching. So when they looked at him with bulging eyes or with whispers, it says this is impossible or impractical. He said, you've already supposed to have been doing this. <clears throat> Jesus' method for doing this, as we see throughout, is to is to contrast as he reminds his disciples he's we're going to hear these words over and over you have heard that it was said but i say to you you have heard that it was said but i say to you over and over and over you see what jesus is doing is he is contrasting the external righteousness of the pharisees with the essence of the law. What did we say the essence of the law was last week? The essence of the law is reverence for God. The first, the first of the Ten Commandments, the first four of the Ten Commandments, reverence for God. The last six of the Ten Commandments, respect for man. That's the essence of the law. So he's going to con contrast them with each other. And, and we see... As if, if your Bible is like mine, you're going to have break marks with all of these life situations. And every one of them, as, as, as we see, they're, they're going to be not very many areas of life that are left out. This first one that we're going to talk about today is murder. It's really not murder, it's really anger. The second one is adultery and, and marriage, and what, it, what, and what does that mean? So, and, and that really isn't adultery and marriage, it's really coveting. The third is truth-telling, or integrity, if you will. 
He's going to keep going through retaliation, the law of retaliation. If we get this first one right today, then we'll get the retaliation piece right later. Love, love for who? Love for your friends and your enemies. Prayer, anxiety, and worry, which I am not going to apologize for preaching, and I hope you don't take that week off. There may be some that you'll want to take the week off, but I would, I would ask you to not take that week off. Money, religion, if you will, life area after life area after life area. But he begins, he begins with the second recorded sin in the Bible or the first murder. Jesus says this, verse 21. He says, this is the bar, all right? And each one of these, what we're going to do is we're going to identify the bar, the cultural bar, and then we're going to look at how Jesus resets that but we're also going to see that Jesus is not going to just reset the bar. He's going to give you some tools. He's going to give you some principles to help you overcome, beat the new standard to be able to live according to what he says. All right. So what is the bar? What is murder? Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13 says what? Very simply... Thou shalt not kill, or you shall not murder. Right? <clears throat> Jesus says in verse 21 here, right, this is the bar of the day. Right? There's the standard that was set by God, and now here we have the bar of the day, the standard of today. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. Does Exodus 20, 13 say anything about anything else? It just says, you shall not murder. The culturally accepted piece of that then was also dealt with Numbers chapter 35 and verse 30 where the scribes, and the, the scribes then added this penalty for killing, which murder is really, it's just the physical act. What, what it got down to was because of Numbers 3530, okay, the physical act of killing a man intentionally. That's what murder in their day was. Murder in our day is just, it, it is just the, the physical act of killing a man. Exodus 20, 13 says, thou shalt not kill, which means thou shalt, so, and as we, we looked at that, it's these broad principles that are to be used with, the, interpreted according to, with God's help as to how do I live my life? What is it that God values about life? You see, God's very clear about the sanctity of life. And so he says, you have heard that it was said, that was the bar, but he's going to reset it. But I say to you, but I say to you, that murder is really the culmination or the end result of a whole bunch of sins, and that, yes, that is plural, a whole bunch of sins that weren't ever dealt with that led to the killing. And Jesus says, even if the physical act did not happen. What does he mean by that? What does that look like? He goes on to say a couple of things in verse 22 that, that kind of flesh that out. Whoever says to his brother... Raka will be in danger of the council. Now, 
there's all kinds of interpretations for raka. All right, I just like to say that because it sounds, if you, if you roll it right, it's just. But here's the thing. That's really the essence of the word. It's R-A-C-A. R-A-C-A. Raka. All right, it's in, in verse 22. It really has more to do with the tone of your voice than what it is you're actually saying. I say to you, Raka, what I'm really saying is, I don't like you very much right now. And you know that based on what? The tone of my voice. I'm not happy with what you're doing or what you just did. But then, and, and so, but then it says, whoever says, and really what it means is, is like, you empty head. That's one of the interpretations for that word. You empty head. But then he goes on and he says, but and whoever says to his brother, you fool, shall be in danger uh, of hellfire. And what that means is when you say something like you fool to your brother in the same tone of voice as you would say raka, right? What you're really saying is you got a you got a problem in your morality and the way you live and and it's and it's no good and 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 I hate you. Let these words never come out of your mouth. I hate you. Because what you have done, Jesus is saying, is you have just, in your heart, performed something that is liable to condemn you. You have just committed murder. You didn't do the physical act, but you did it in your heart. Let these words never come out of your mouth. He says, I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother, New King James says, without a cause. Some translations don't have that, all right? Don't have that phrase, without a cause. But it's there because of the particular word that's used in, in translation. See, we translate the, the, the Greek into to English, and, and we don't, unless we understand what the particular word was, we don't really know what that means. But that means is angry, that the word for angry there is angry that you let simmer. It is really, you have no reason to be angry, but you just let it simmer. You, I, nurture the thought of being angry. I never let it go away. Every time I see you, that thing festers in my heart for you. Every time you, your, your number comes on my speed dial or my, my caller ID, it's like, uh, I let it simmer. I let it, don't ever let it go away. I keep bringing it back up in my own mind. This is what Jesus is saying. What we must remember. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. But by the grace of God, everyone, everyone, has the capacity to be as evil as the most evil person you ever can remember hearing about. 
but by the grace of God. What do we call that? We call that prevenient grace. That grace of God which he showers upon, yes, even those who are not children of God, there, there is a grace out there to, that holds sin at bay, if you will. But there is the capacity to do just what you can, can dream up, in the, that the most evil person can dream up in their mind. 1 Corinthians 15.10, but by the grace of God. Jesus' new teaching is this. One commentator put it this way. It is not enough not to commit a sin in the physical way. It is not enough not to commit a sin. The only thing that is enough is to not to wish to commit it. That's the reset. The only thing that is enough is to not to wish to commit it. How does Jesus say then we should deal with this anger? Because it's not murder he's talking about. Murder is the physical act as a result of a whole host of sins that we do not deal with. The first, and and what we're talking about here is anger. And we must admit to our anger Yes, it is okay to be angry. It is okay to be angry. If it's the right kind of anger and if it's dealt with according to what to to how Jesus is going to tell us to deal with it. First, I have to admit that there is anger there, and but it also has some effects. You see, anger affects your worship. It affects your worship. And that's why he says, if, you're, if you bring your gift to the altar, if you come to worship, and there that you remember that you have something that your brother has against you, he says, stop where you are. In their day, it would be, leave your lamb with the priest. Say, I'll be back in a bit. I can't offer this in my present heart state. Go, be reconciled, then come back and place your hand on the lamb which was part of the process of their uh, sacrifice. If you can't do that, you're not able to receive what God has in store for you as you came to worship. So we have to admit to our anger, and we have to deal with that early. Deal with it early. Verse 24 and 25, it says, it says, Uh, Leave your gift, uh, be reconciled to your brother, and agree with your adversary quickly while you are still on the way with him. (sighs) All right. We live in an angry world right now, in a world full of anger. So I get, sometimes I get to have these conversations about, what, well, what are you preaching on this week? Uh, and, and, uh, and so, and, and, I, and I love these conversations because one of them came up this week, what are you preaching on this week? I'm preaching on anger and its harmful effects. And, and well, we're not even supposed to be angry, are we? Well, absolutely you can be angry, but how are you going to deal with it? Well, if we deal with it early, what does that look like? All right, because Paul tells us, and the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 and 26, it says, it says, be angry and do not sin. And do not let your, the sun go down on your wrath, all right, nor give place to the devil. What does this look like? It says, this is only attainable if I... If I choose to deal with my attitudes, to deal with my emotions, to deal with my tendencies before 
they reach the point of being sinful. What is today? August the 15th. Who does Proverbs today? August is my month to read Proverbs, right? August the 15th. God is so good to me. Because, see, this is the deal. This is one of the things that I have to deal with. This anger issue is one of the things that I have to deal with, right? Verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1, is for your pastor. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Verse 2, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. I'm preaching about anger on August the 15th, 2021. I chose, I didn't choose, it worked out, of course, it worked out that I was going to do the Proverbs in my wisdom reading for this year in August, which happened to be a date when August the 15th fell on a Sunday and God not so unprovidentially set it in place that I was going to preach on anger on the 15th. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Oh, guess what? I'm not off the hook tomorrow. Chapter 16, verse 32. Don't you just love how God works? Don't you just love how God works? He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. I'm never reading the Proverbs again. Or I'm checking the calendar before I do, right? Here we go. We have to deal with our anger early. It is okay to be angry, but we cannot sin. I have to choose how do I deal with my attitudes? How do I deal with my emotions? How do I deal with my tendencies? What are my tendencies? My tendency is to lash. My tendency, and this is what's so great for, for you all, What's so great for you all is you don't understand my sarcasm because you can't hear my tone of voice. Sometimes it would be better if you couldn't hear how I said it. That's why I have, we have a standing rule, Tracy and my daughter. We have a standing rule, and she used it on me about two weeks ago, and it was, prob- and it was absolutely warranted and Somewhat well received. My standing rule with my wife and my daughter is you want to back that up and say it again with a different tone of voice. It will be heard a whole lot better if you do. Because my tendencies are not that way. You see, so I have to do that, and I have to do that with the Holy Spirit's help. It's the only way I can do it is with the Holy Spirit's help because we know that one of the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, self-control, they are not human-based spirits. Fruits, I mean, they are not human-based fruits. They are only spirit-given fruits. I cannot control myself without the Holy Spirit's help. I can't do it. It's been proven over and over and over and over. Maybe some of you, and if that's the case, I truly ask for your forgiveness. But that's where we are. Let me give you... An example, I, so, so I started this out. So Jesus is talking about murder. Jesus is talking about the second recorded sin in the Bible, all right? In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 5, we, we read uh, uh, of the, the story of Cain and Abel, and you all know the story of Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother, and that was the, that was the big sin, right? 
The big sin was murder. No, the physical act was murder. What was the big sin? wasn't even anger. The big sin was not dealing with his anger. Right? Listen, Adam knew in, in, in the process of time, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his often offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. All right? First thing that happens with Cain is he got angry. Is it okay? Somebody please say yes. Okay? Yes. All right? But let's go through the story, because we like to skip these parts but they're very vital to the story. The first question God asked Cain was what? Why are you angry? We could diffuse a lot of situations, but we'll just say, why are you angry? What are you mad about? I don't even know sometimes. I don't even know what I'm mad about. I'm just mad. Right? Sometimes we don't even know. we got to drill down to even get to the point where we even know what we're mad about. Why was, why was Cain angry? He was angry because he knew, if we drill down all the way, Cain was angry because he knew in his heart that he didn't present the proper sacrifice. He wasn't mad at God. He wasn't mad at Abel. He was mad at Cain. Cain was mad at Cain. Most of the time that I get in trouble when, in my anger is because I'm mad at me because I know I didn't do something that would have changed the, what, the situation that I'm in. Why are you angry, God said. And here's where the conversation got really good this week. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. Or sin is crouching at your door. Sin is doing what? It's doing what? What does that mean? Brilliant insight this week, Larry. Brilliant insight. Sin is crouching at your door, waiting for you to give it an opportunity to rule over you. Why are you angry? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should, you should rule over your anger, not your anger rule over you. Sin is crouching at your door. There is no temptation overtaking you but what? Such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that which you can stand, but will with the temptation provide a way out that you may be able to Bear it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would, if anyone would open the door, you see, just as sin is not 
beating down your door. God is not beating down your door. But sin is only crouching. God is calling. Thank you for that conversation this week. Cain goes and takes care of business in the wrong way. It wasn't until after he did that that God said to him, what have you done? You see, Cain would never have murdered Abel if he had answered the question, why are you angry? The last example, the thing that, that Jesus says to us is, <clears throat> change my heart, oh God. Change my heart. What does that look like? Verse 24, he says, be reconciled to your brother. Agree with your adversary quickly. You know what? I did something to offend you, and I am sorry. Will you forgive me? Romans 12, verse 17 and 18 says to us, as much as it depends on you to live at peace with all men. All God is asking you to do is your part. I can't change. God, I, I can't change your heart attitude toward me. But I can ask God to change my heart. We love to sing that song, Change My Heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. You know what the words are. May I be like you. Oh, you know the words. You are the potter and I am the clay. Mold me and make me so I can stay just the same way. That's not how it goes? Is that how we live? It says, mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. The challenges to our hearts from Jesus will not get any easier as we work through this list. Some of these will hit you different than they will hit me. This one today, this was all for me. This one was for me. This one was for your pastor. Some of these are going to hit closer to home for you than they do for me. But none of these... None of these can be done in our own strength. So here's what I need you to remember. You see, Jesus didn't just say these words and then run home to the Father. Jesus said these words, and he stayed, and he walked, and he talked, and he taught, and he, and he prayed, and he taught, and he lived an example for his disciples every single day for three years. And he modeled for them as he continued to teach them how to live a kingdom life, how to live a life that looked towards heaven. But he didn't stop there, my friends. He didn't stop there. Because then he said, I am going away. And here's our great promise, church. I am going away. And when I go away, I will pray the Father, 
to send you another helper, the Spirit of truth, and he will remain with you forever. We can't do it in our own strength, and we don't have to. He will be with us, the Holy Spirit, to help us to deal with the life situations of a disciple. Let me pray with you. Father, as we absorb your word today, and as we, we, we look at what you have to say to us, God, it is clear that your heart for us is to be a heart of worship. And that we cannot worship if we haven't come to you with a clean heart. So God, I pray even this morning that we would first and foremost say, change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Mold me and make me like, just like you. And Father, if there's, there's, there are those who need to, to deal with a brother, that they would take that opportunity that they would call quickly and that they would do their part to receive the blessing that you have waiting for them as they come and as they worship. Father, thank you for Jesus' words. God, even as it's hard, I thank you for the challenge. God, my prayer this morning even as we, as I changed this last song, asked Rob to sing this song, is because I need your help. As we sing this song, and we're dismissed this morning, I pray you will sing it in the attitude that you've just heard. Let's stand, sing this song, and be dismissed this morning. Change my heart, oh God. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever
great week.